Okay, welcome to those of you who are joining. Uh, this is uh, coming to you from the Ioneer Foundation. Uh, this is our new biweekly lunchtime webinar series for research and clinical innovations at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic is, I'm not old, why do I sound it? Uh, this is uh, going to be presented by Drs. Libby Smith and Jackie Gardner-Schmidt, co-directors of the UPMC Voice Center. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. Uh, the Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck. We work closely with the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide annually to these two departments stimulate and advance groundbreaking research, and that support is only possible because of philanthropic donations. So thank you for all those who've supported the Ioneer Foundation over the years, and thank you for your interest in today's program. Before we start, I need to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, this is a Zoom product. It's a Zoom webinar product. So many of you are familiar with Zoom now, but um, for those of you who aren't, um, you know, we'll, we'll uh, help you catch up here. The, uh, there's a little function down below that says chat. And in most Zoom, you can chat, but we're turning chat off. So don't even bother going to that bubble. But there's another bubble at the bottom that says Q&A. You can click on the Q&A and you can answer questions, you can ask questions any time during today's presentation. We will hold all questions to the end where I'll read your questions so that the panelists can answer them. So uh, what we will ask is try to refrain from asking uh, very personal health questions. Um, I'll skip over any that, that I feel hit that category, but we will try to answer them the email afterwards. So don't refrain from really asking the questions you wanna ask. Um, tomorrow you'll receive a survey via email to provide us with feedback. You'll also be added to our email list to receive future, future webinars. Introducing today's program and speakers is Dr. Jonas Johnson, Distinguished Service Professor and Chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology and the Eugene and Myers Endowed Chair at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Johnson, please take it away. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, we uh, welcome you. We're so happy you're able to join us for this webinar. Uh, the Voice Center was established 25 years ago in the Department of Otolaryngology. It physically resides currently at the Mercy Hospital. The co-directors uh, and today's speakers are going to be Dr. Jackie Gardner-Schmidt and Dr. Libby Smith. So uh, we are proud to present this program. Thanks again for participating. All right, Libby, take it away. All right, yeah, can you... All right, so hi, I'm Libby, and that was Jackie that you just heard. So we're really um, excited to be here today. We have a lot of very exciting things going on in the Voice Center currently. Out of all the things we're doing, we decided today to talk to you about vocal fold atrophy and its associated voice changes. All right, can you change? So just so you know, all the patients who we will show today pixelated, though you'll still hear their voices because that's important germane to our content, um, have provided written consent for all the videos in this presentation. All right, so we're going to take a journey over the next hour. Um, we're going to be talking about aging in general. More, we're going to then take it into aging of the voice box, i.e. how do we sound. We're going to go through some treatment options with the recognition that aging affects more than just the voice, and we'll get into that. And then with all of that in mind, we're going to set forth reasonable expectations that can be explored with those different treatment options. So we've noticed, Jackie and I have noticed that over the last several years, we are seeing more and more patients who present who are older and have voice issues. So in the metropolitan Pittsburgh area, they say about a quarter of the population is over the age of 65, which then leads to that. So aging is a destination, a journey. It's not a disorder. We know that this is gonna happen. And to everyone, that journey is a little bit different, but the same basic tenets hold true. 
So for some, it's quite a journey, as in this lady, this young lady at the ripe age of 100. Um, what, we've, what we think is that as people live longer and are more active later in their years, they want the voice that will match that. So studies have shown that about a quarter to a third of elderly patients report having a voice disorder. Next. And we think that this is probably due to the phenomenon. I remember about 10 years ago, there's a big talk about 40s, the new 30, and then 50s, the new 40. And now 70s, the new 60, and actually I would submit probably the new 50. So people are doing more longer and also working later in their years. And so what we found is that as you have an an older working population, you need to have a voice that matches that. So we're going to be talking about presbyphonia. That presby is old phonia sound. And so we're going to talk about hoarseness with age-related laryngeal changes, presby laryngeus, changes in the voice box, and also pulmonary changes associated with aging. Patients with vocal fold atrophy have though varied, always the same sort of complaints. So it's usually gradual hoarseness, raspiness, inconsistency, not quite sure what's going to come out when they do talk. They get tired talking, so they'll say, oh, my voice is better in the morning and not as good by the evening. Decreased projection, so you have a hard time being heard across a room, a dinner table, at, especially at loud restaurants and therefore they'll strain, they'll feel a lot of tension in their throat. Sometimes breathiness, if the vocal folds just can't even get close enough together and a reduced range. So it's really a, a cornucopia of different symptoms, but it's always something in there that people are identifying with. We also note that in males, the voice tends to get higher in pitch and in females, lower in pitch, and that's to be expected. Now, those are the things that people complain of, but really what it is, is it's a functional impact on their quality of life, which we find is the most important thing oftentimes for patients. They want to be able to talk to their grandchildren, sing at church, et cetera, et cetera. So the area that we're talking about is seated right in the middle of the neck, kind of below the chin. If you feel your neck, you can actually feel something kind of hard in the middle. That's the voice box, and that's where the vocal folds live. All right, so this is a video showing um, what we basically do in the office. This is an exam of the voice box. What you see first in the middle are, um, are the vocal folds. Just turn the high, high low e to a high e like this. So the vocal folds in the middle forming that white V, and you'll see they open to get air in, and then here they're closed, and that's how you make sound that pressurized air coming up from the lungs, mm -hmm. um, causing the vocal folds to vibrate and thus make sound. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are two components to making sound. You need to get the vocal folds close enough together. And you also need to have this wave that generates across them. It's called a mucosal wave. And it looks like rocks being flicked on a pond in that kind of ripple effect. You see that on the vocal fold. So when we think about the anatomy of the vocal fold, there's, it's a multi-layered, very complex structure. We break it down in the relation to atrophy of bulk and tonicity. So what we know happens is that as people age, the muscle gets smaller and also this jelloey material seen here at colored in yellow is what allows that ripple wave to happen that also changes with aging so our vocal folds get skinnier but they also get floppier and so i think of it like a guitar string where it's not only a skinny guitar string but it's also too loose and we all know that then the string doesn't work well so when Patients come in, sometimes their question is, well, I just want to make sure I don't have cancer, which is a very reasonable concern. And go ahead, Jackie. And so for that answer, we can pretty much almost tell you that day, yes or no, it does not look like cancer. Um, most often not, because there's no lesions associated with atrophy. It's a thinning of the vocal folds. So we can provide that reassurance. And for some patients, that's all they need. And they have peace of mind and they're, they're happy campers. Other patients come in and they have vocal effort issues, that strain, um, 
fatigue, forcefulness that they're trying to speak with. When we treat those patients, we know that, yeah, we do pretty good, and we're going to get into treatments in a second. We do pretty good with them, but it's a little bit trickier. When patients come in with just pure voice quality issues, I don't like the raspiness of my, of my voice, we struggle with that because oftentimes that's related to that tonicity component. So um, some of our future research is actually designed to better understand this last voice quality challenging group of patients so that we can help them more. All right, Jackie. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Jackie. So to segue, I'm gonna talk about treatment and my world is voice therapy and how we can help patients with the most conservative measure possible. So as Libby said, most patients want to know and be assured that they don't have cancer. About 39% of our uh, patient population. 57% of our population can be helped with voice therapy in this particular study and we would agree Agree with this and about 6% end up going to surgery and sometimes after surgery in fact a lot of times after surgery we do post-operative voice therapy I'm going to start off with a patient who we inherited and I want you to take a listen to his voice and and then we're gonna do a scope the stroboscopy and laryngeal imaging that Libby showed you prior to this was someone who was a healthy 30 year old female Email, and so those are young vocal folds. So um, let's take a listen to this chap right here. And it's going to be a little quiet because part of his complaints, as often it is with atrophy patients that have presbyphonia, is that they have decreased volume when they speak. So I'm going to turn it up as much as when possible. The sunlight strikes, raindrops in the air, they act like a prism, they form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. Okay, and just tell me what brings you in today? I got a raspy voice, I cough and mucus. And, uh, I did. And oftentimes, patients will not only talk about their voice being raspy and low volume, but they'll also talk about increased. Uh, mucus and throat clearing. Here's a picture of his strobe. And I want you to appreciate just how squeezed he is and how his vocal folds look a little skinny. This is what we call muscle tension dysphonia secondary to atrophy. Now, one would think when you go to voice therapy, we do voice therapy exercises, and we often call them exercises a little bit to our detriment because unfortunately, unlike physical therapy where we can bulk up an instrument or bulk up the instrument, in this case, the voice box, we can't do that with the vocal folds, even though the vocal folds are striated muscles just like our bi biceps. So unfortunately, everyone, we can't go from this to to this. However, what we can do is what um, I will call very easily oomph therapy and really engage the respiratory system and the laryngeal system to get a better sound. As Libby, Dr. Smith was talking about, not only does the, um, uh, the muscle waste away, it's called sarcopenia, uh, we get a decrease in mass of the vocal fold muscles, but the vocal fold muscles oftentimes also become less toned, flaccid. So if you think of the vocal folds as two little um, pieces of jello here, the airflow that's needed, which is the breath support, to get those two vocal folds to vibrate symmetrically is a lot. So that's what we work on. On with patients. So this particular patient I saw three times and this is how he sounded after therapy. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of what 
So the voice was clearer, the voice was higher in pitch and louder. And the other thing, because in voice therapy, we took away all the squeezing, his complaints of increased mucus and throat clearing and cough also dissipated because now it wasn't such a tight mechanism feeling all those sometimes natural secretions that we had. The other thing in voice therapy, as I said, it's not just the larynx that starts to age, but it's the respiratory system. And we tend to be a little voice box centric here at the voice center and forget about the driving system, the power of voice, which is the voice box. So here's a, a question for you. Which balloon, if we think of the balloon as our um, respiratory system and our lungs, do you think is going to energize? the vocal folds more. Is it going to be this one or is it going to be this one? When we age, the respiratory system also ages in something called lung compliance and muscle strength. So we have muscles in between our ribs called the intercostal muscles and they also don't they, um, they lose their strength. And there's something called elastic recoil when we take a breath in and then there, and our, our lungs recoil and bring up that air and pressure to vibrate the vocal folds. And that is also uh, decreased in the elderly. So the question is, what can we do? Now, we can't strengthen the vocal folds, but the good news is that we can actually strengthen the respiratory system. And there's something on the market, you can go to Google and look this up, it's called EMST, Expiratory Muscle Strength Trainer. It's called EMST 150, it's about 50 bucks. And patients can be taught how to use this to ostensibly increase their expiratory muscle strength. And we know that the expiratory muscle strength decreases more than the inspiratory muscle strength with uh, adults. Just FYI, there's also an IMST, which is inspiratory uh, muscle strength trainer, but with uh, presbyphonia, we often use the EMST. We've just finis finished a study with uh, Emory University and ourselves uh, looking at patients that were randomized into two groups. One had voice therapy specifically designed for presbyphonia called Forte, phonation resistant training exercises. And then the other group had Forte, voice therapy plus EMST. This is a pilot study and uh, statistically significant uh, was not shown between the two. However, because it was a small N, this is an unfunded study, the, what we looked at was the uh, trajectory seemed to be a little bit more favorable for the voice therapy plus EMST. But we just need to get funding now and uh, get a lar larger N, so we, the, the study is more favorably powered. So the challenge with voice therapy, and this is where we're going to segue to Dr. Smith, is when the vocal folds have a little bit of muscle that's gone away, a little bit of tone that's gone away, voice therapy can absolutely help. Because at the end of the day, the voice box is really like a hardware, a computer hardware. And if the hardware is good, voice therapy is the software. But if the hardware is not good and there's physiological limitations to the vocal folds, then voice therapy, quite frankly, is useless. Uh, and we'll do voice therapy after the patient has surgery. So to that point, I want to show you um, another patient that we inherited and take a listen to this patient's sound compared to the first one. When the sunlight strikes the raindrops in the air, they act like a prism. So this patient has a strange quality, very hoarse and um, very soft. The vocal folds in this static picture look perfectly fine, but I'm going to show you them vibrating. The sound is purposely off because I want you to look at the middle. In general, we shouldn't see anything in the middle because the vocal folds are coming together. But we see 
a big old hole in the middle. This is what we call um, the Mack truck larynx. You could drive a Mack truck through this larynx. So in this particular case, I have to call on my friend, Dr. Smith, and we need some surgery to this larynx to uh, help it so, voice, so we can help them in voice therapy if they even need it. So on to you, Dr. Smith. All right, so at this point, I pop back into the picture in this team multidisciplinary approach this guy needs hardware. He needs something to work with. His vocal folds can't get anywhere near each other because they're so atrophic. So there are many different types of surgeries um, for vocal fold atrophy, but all of them are with the idea of increasing bulk. So turning back time to some extent for that sarcopenia and that decrease in that jelloey layer of the vocal fold, so we have to remember that, you know, even with this gentleman, turns out he just needed bulk and he only needed it one time, which really shocked me. So we're always still surprised sometimes, but there's always this trade-off or the different components of bulk and the, and the tone. And so if your issue is mostly bulk and your tone's good, then bulking procedures work. It makes sense. If your issues are more related to the tonicity, the floppiness of the vocal folds, and your bulk is pretty good, adding more bulk won't necessarily help. So the way I tell patients, it's that I'm gonna, I can give you fat floppy vocal folds and we'll see if those work better for you. And so this is where that personalization for each patient is so key. Um, not only in maybe the types of surgeries we try, but also even more the expectations for surgery. So he underwent a bulking procedure, um, and here's his voice. I'll let him speak for himself. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like prisms and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. And how have you been since your last visit? Wonderful. How do you think your voice is any better, same, different? Much better. All right, so uh, here's his video. And you can, you'll see that that Mack truck effect is actually gone now. Good, go a little bit higher pitch. Good, do that again, but go longer. So we see that, that maybe the vocal folds don't come all the way together. There's still sometimes that little sliver of air but wow, is that an improvement, right? So he was super happy and actually never needed to have anything else done. So when it comes to bulk being the issue, surgery works actually really well. And uh, I guess in honor of the Pirates opening day on Friday, <laughs> that, um, you know, this is there for it. But so <clears throat> that's a home run. We love to see that. Um, it's not always the case. And like I said, every person is different. And part of that difference, Jackie, yeah, so we can fill a gap, and that's what Dr. Smith does. When the tone is not so good, that's yeah, a little questionable. And we can also work on the power source, which is the airflow in voice therapy. Another thing that is 100% part of this is this beautiful instrument that we have resides in our body. So if our body feels like poop, we don't sound good. And in the elderly, frailty is a big, big thing. So we check with our patients and we have frailty um, screening uh, questionnaires uh, that can also be part of this. Obviously, if a patient is more active and energized, that's going to also show up in the voice. Um, Libby talked about keeping, um, we always keep uh, high hopes, but maybe expectations low. Uh, there's a reason that the marathon race times for people that are over 60 are a little bit um, uh, longer than for younger. Um, and, uh, and, and working with patients to to really uh, talk to them about what a, a realistic goal is for them. Um, so presby uh, presbyphonia, it's not all uh, created equal. The tone and the bulk, and that's very individualized. The pulmonary, the, the um, frailty, and the expectations. I want to end with a, a kind of funny video here, uh, and then we'll take some questions. And this is a chap that, uh, well, anyways, I'm just going to 
play it for you. Pretty much the diagnosis is that I'm an old man and my voice is weakening as I grow old. But they're going to inject something into my vocal cords to make me a man again. It's Cialis for the voice. So I hope that's okay that I did that. Anyways, just ending on a funny note, but Libby and I would be pleased uh, through Lonnie to read some of your chat questions and open it up. I just wanted to end off with, um, in 2010, we did a study here and it was a retro retrospective study on, uh, I was over 120 patients looking at, hey, are we helping folks with surgery and with uh, voice therapy? And to be honest with you, our um, our results were not as 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 much and happy as we would wanted them to be. And what we want to do is do a um, ten year anniversary study on our database, looking back with all of our patients to see exactly who we help and what their larynx looks like, so we can individualize care more and more. Because the last thing that we want to um, leave you all with is that it's just even though that was a funny video then it's just an easy easy bulk up of the vocal folds and you know do three sessions in voice therapy um, it, it's different for each patient and we really need to almost profile which patients um, we can we can help and which patients we can really set expectations with so thank you Wow, thank you both. That was that was really fantastic. You know, I I, um, I have to say, you know, I, I always enjoy going to the voice center because it's a very energetic uh, environment. I mean, just from the people that work there, but also you you really do see the difference in people who have been helped by the voice center and how much they've appreciated uh, what uh, it, it's what the experience of improving your voice when you're struggling. So um, uh, this will. We have lots of questions, so keep putting some questions in. I'll get to those. I just wanted to kind of start off by just repeating the statistic that was shared in the invitation. So by 2030, approximately 20% of the U.S. population will be over 65 years of age. And it says, unfortunately, between 19 to 29% of the generally elder po elderly population have voice disorders. That's really astounding. And again, just... Uh, brings relevance to why this is such an important topic. So thank you both. You're welcome. Okay. So uh, first question um, says, I cannot tolerate having the camera down my throat to video my vocal cords. Can this test be done under some type of sedation or with volume or something, uh, some calming medication? So, so I'll take that. So um, unfortunately not. So you can't be sedated and, and voice at the same time. So uh, for patients who have a very strong gag reflex, um, I'm, maybe this person has this issue, um, we can spray, we can use extra numbing medicines to help with that. But oftentimes um, with skill, the, the little camera that's used to look down at the voice box is placed in a location where it's not really touching anything. And so hopefully they then can tolerate it. Um, but yeah, some people just have a harder time. We can look at going through the nose with the scope, which is the most common thing we do probably for atrophy, but there's also a way to do it through the mouth. So some patients prefer one over the other. I do have a couple patients who have anxiety as a general baseline. And so I'm pretty sure some of them have pre-medicated before they come in, but, um, but you do have to be awake for it because you have to be an active participant. Okay. Um, this is uh, an interesting question. What are a couple of vocal exercises you can do, you can demonstrate for us to keep our vocal cord larynx operating healthy? And uh, um, tell me if this is possible, Dr. Johnson, if you want to unmute yourself and, and show yourself. 
Jackie, could you have Dr. Johnson <laughs> practice those? <laughs> uh -huh. Dr. Johnson. Well, what I, what I want to show you first, which can, which can actually really get everything going, is everyone has so, a water bottle with water, and probably, uh, Jonas, you don't have a straw. But putting a straw in a water bottle, or just in general, and blowing bubbles while you make sound is called water resistant therapy. So I'm gonna give you an example right here. And although it seems deceptively simple, it actually does three things for the vocal folds. Again, it doesn't bulk the vocal folds, we can't strengthen the vocal folds, but it does the three S's. The first thing is there's a certain amount of back pressure that goes on to the vocal folds and it spreads the back of the vocal folds apart. And when it spreads the back of the vocal folds apart, it allows the vocal folds to stretch and so we can go higher and higher in pitch and it also allows the vocal folds to square up so the vibratory impact stress of, of voicing phonation is uh, goes over a larger area of, um, of, of tissue so it doesn't harm and it feels wonderful because one of the things with one of the complaints is that patients get fatigued and they feel that there's lots of effort. So think of this as going to the gym. This is yoga of the vocal folds. As far as an exercise goes, um, one of the, the exercises, it's much more of awareness really, is to make sure that we are using that airflow is when we feel the sounds of speech here at the teeth, the lips, the tip of the tongue and we speak more loudly, we know that we're really engaging our respiratory system. So those are two things. This is one that makes you feel good and this is one that you can just use in conversational speech. So it's using a little bit more oomph, but you have to feel it here because if I get louder and squeeze from my throat muscles and not feel it from here, I'm straining. And that's what we don't want to happen. So you're off the hook, Jonas. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> I'm so that was remarkable. I've always instructed my children not to blow through a straw. At the <laughs> there you I, go. I'm so disappointed. I really tried to put them on the, <laughs> on the hook. All right. So um, another good question. Uh, are there certain risk factors to make bulk tone worse in some patients versus others? Or is it just individualized biology differences between patients? So it's probably a combination of the two. Some people, you know, they're 90 years old, they are coming in with a family member, so I'm not looking at their vocal folds, but they sound great, right? And they don't have any perceived voice issues. Others will have a very minimal voice issue that they perceive is huge. And that comes down to how it affects their own daily living, right? So it's very personalized on that sense. It, sometimes it's hard for us to hear it. But from a, like a baseline general health standpoint, the health, it comes to that frailty question. The more frail you are, the less oomph you're going to have, the vocal folds Oftentimes they do get atrophied, sarcopenic with that, but if you don't have oomph, it doesn't matter how big your fat your vocal folds are because you have nothing to drive it. I talk, I talk to patients about, it's like trying to drive a car without any gas. You can push it, but it's going to be really slow. And so you yeah. need to have gas to drive the system that oomph. So frailty is a big factor. So if you have lots of medical comorbidities, that cause you to have a generalized decreased energy level, you will therefore have, no matter what your vocal folds look like, a decreased voice quality. And so Libby will oftentimes ask the SLP, the speech team, you know, do some stimulability because if this patient doesn't have the oomph factor, I'm not gonna risk going to surgery with that patient. All right. Excellent. Another good question. Keep them coming, folks. This is excellent. As your research on the effectiveness of voice therapy over the years moves forward, 
will you include a focus on your experience with the Texas-based Parkinson's Voice Projects, yeah. Speak Out, and Loud Crowd programs, yep. Yep. and reconsider UPMC's involvement with the internationally distinguished program? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So there's three therapies really that are out there that energize the system. One is what I called uh, Forte, the phonation resistance uh, training exercises. The other one is called Speak Out. Uh, and it is for Parkinson's patients, but Parkinson's patients also have atrophy. And, you know, we still don't know from a research standpoint if Parkinson's patients have atrophy because they have Parkinson's or because Parkinson's patients are more, I mean, they're most times elderly. Um, and because they're elderly, they have atrophy. And no one has looked into um, Michael J. Fox, you know, young onset Parkinson's patients. Do they have an atrophied larynx because it's only then that we would know if it's an atrophied larynx that goes with Parkinson's or it's just a coincidence because most people who get Parkinson's are old. Wow, that was a run on sentence. Sorry, folks. However, so speak, uh, speak out. And there's another one called Lee Silverman voice training, LSVT, loud crowd, and that's another one for Parkinson's. And basically, you know, they all do the same thing. They get patients loud in a healthy way. And they're, yeah, they're great. Now, one of the questions we often get is patients will say, is this ever going to become a habit? Am I always going to have to think, think about it? And the answer is yes, because the mechanism has changed. Even if we can get it better in voice therapy or and or Dr. Smith and surgery helps, but the, the mechanism is different. And so we, we work with patients and teach them that you can have vocal choices. So if you are talking to your grandchildren over the phone or you're doing a Skype like we are now, you can turn it on in a safe way but when you're with your uh, wife or husband and you just want to say, pass the salt, then you know your voice is going to be a little bit more raspy. It's going to be a little bit more comfortable, not as much effort. And so we work with patients to, uh, yeah, just to, to have vocal choices. Okay. Great question. Okay. So, it, you know, make sure that you, you ask them to pass the salt very loudly and prominently. <laughs> you can or not. <laughs> Is there value in purchasing an EMS T150 device to use daily to maintain lung strength, like an exercise device for the lungs? Sure, there's a lot of research on it. Um, it's used five times a day for five weeks is the protocol. And there's a little bit more research coming out, not a lot, uh, we need to look more into it, about how long it lasts. And because there has to be a maintenance program that goes along with that, and we don't exactly know what the maintenance program is. Um, Christine Sapienza is one of the originator inventors of the EMST 150. There's a couple of different ones that are on the market, but most uh, believe that the EMST 150 is, is great. So, you know, to answer your question, there are some patients um, with some cardiac um, problems uh, that may not, and it's all on there, um, uh, may not be the best patient for this, but you can get it. It's over the counter, if you will. Um, absolutely. Okay. All right. So um, just a few more here. So is there anything that can be done to prevent vocal atrophy? We don't think so. Short answer, no. <laughs> so I think that the, we can't change the biology that's hardwired in you to have skinnier vocal folds at different levels, at different ages, with different tonicity. But what, we, what, but what we can impact is that activeness. So the mm -hmm. pulmonary component, which, you know, Jackie said that we oftentimes forget about the pulmonary component, but actually I would say we actually think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. And we unfortunately can only do surgery and therapy to optimize 
the, the, the vocal component, but the therapy in addition can work on the pulmonary component. So I would say, you know, in general, being more active is always better. The more oomph you have is always better. So that's probably the best thing that someone could do to hold off your body's response to the atrophy that's going to occur. All right. So a common story that we hear is that, yeah, I was trucking along really good with my voice. And then I got sick. I went to the hospital, something happened. And they, and all that I see is that the vocal folds are skinny, right? And they have vocal fold atrophy, but you know what? It probably wasn't new. They probably had that atrophy for 10, 20, 30 years, but they were able to compensate for it. So something else changed in the system to make them use their vocal folds differently. And, and a lot of times it probably is the respiratory drive. So working on the respiratory drive would be probably the most important thing to do. Okay, very, very good. Um, does losing your voice when you're sick or, take, or talking with a hoarse voice cause long-term cause long damage? It can. Uh, this is not so much atrophy based, but um, in general, you know, hoarseness is never normal. And most voice problems are accumulative episodes of hoarseness, like when you are sick and talking for long periods of time. When your horse, your, your voice box is telling you that it's not happy, and oftentimes with patients, example, teachers are our number one patient population, uh, using the voice for long periods of time, the, the vocal folds think of it as a, um, a wound. And so when the vocal folds think of something as a wound because the vocal folds have been vibrating and vibrating and there's an impact stress, there's something in the body called angiogenesis. It's blood goes to a wound site. If you cut yourself, blood goes to a wound site and it's actually doing good things. It's putting down collagen and it's trying to, to, to um, make the wound go away. The only problem is, is vocal folds also have this vascularity. And if there's too much vascularity that goes to the very kissing edge of where the vocal folds are vibrating, sometimes damage happens in the way of a bleed. Sometimes damage happens over time of continuously getting hoarse is the body um, puts down blood, uh, puts down collagen from the blood. And that is something called a vocal fold scar. And both Libby and myself, so both surgically and behaviorally in voice therapy, scar is super, super hard for us to help. So long answer is yes, you can do damage. Interesting. Can voice therapy help with breathing issues, i.e. shortness of breath? Um, yes, it depends. It, well, it depends why there's shortness of breath. If there's shortness of breath because the vocal folds are not coming together, like the last patient we showed, the Mac truck, voice therapy is not really going to help that. But a lot of patients have shortness of breath because they don't use their airflow correctly and they hold back their air when they're talking like I'm doing right now. Um, and it's, it's rampant. Um, it's called breath holding. Uh, and people will feel that they're short of breath, like they can't take a big breath in. And it has nothing to do with the lower airway. It has to do with how the patient is using their airflow, i.e. they're holding it back. They're not actually letting it out. So voice therapy, is hugely successful for patients with that type of shortness of breath. Wonderful. All right. Well, um, that comes to the end here. Um, I will say that, you know, of the questions, we had uh, lots of very good questions. And we do have some questions that um, I can tell you that, that uh, are, uh, I think, would be better for us to answer offline via email, which we'll send to you that they're and a detail related to personal health. So sure. I'll, um, I'll send those to Dr. Smith and Dr. Uh, Gardner Schmidt. And, um, but uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you certainly to our uh, speakers. Thank you to our attendees and everybody helping put these webinars together. We do have a lot of fun with these. I can say this, that this was the clearest sounding and speaking uh, webinar we have, which is very appropriate <laughs> for our voice group. 
uh, because obviously they're practicing what they preach. So um, thank you so much. We look forward to having uh, a chance to talk to those uh, interested in hearing these webinars. Again, we do these every other week. Um, and so you'll hear uh, a topic related to vision uh, coming up, which is actually a, a, another one I'm looking forward to. It's on retinitis pigmentosa um, that you'll hear uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank you all very much and look forward to, uh, to hearing more from you. My all best. right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.